for you today with three speakers. And I'm gonna go straight into speaker introductions. First, we have Dr. Alan Strauss, who is uh, the director of Mount Lemmon Sky Center. Uh, we also have Anna Marie Shecker from International Dark Sky Association. And finally, I will wrap up the talk. My name is Olia Phillips and I'm the community science coordinator for Tucson Audubon. Thank you all for being here and I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Strauss to share his screen. Thanks, Olya. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Technology. You'd think a year into uh, COVID, we'd all have this worked out, but every day is a new challenge still. Yeah. So, um, so I wanna really uh, first thank Olya and Tucson Audubon for inviting us to partner on this, this talk and this topic. It's, very important to us. Um, you know, the idea of dark skies as a resource and conservation is something close to our hearts, not just for all of the research that happens at the University of Arizona, but also for outreach and education. Um, you know, I don't have to uh, tell you, right, you're all here listening, how beautiful the night skies are. So in some ways, we already have the hook to draw people in. And what we do is use that amazement and wonder that, that people come with and give them an experience. Uh, I think Rosie said she's been to the program. Uh, that they can walk away from and really have a deeper appreciation for the beauty of the night sky, but also the, the beauty of the world around them by day and by night. So I, I really do have the best job on earth. Uh, and uh, full disclosure, my background is not in astronomy. My PhD is in education. And I just married a, a great hobby as an amateur astronomer with uh, many years experience uh, uh, at the university to, to become the director of the Mount Lemmon Science Center. So I'm just trying to get up the presentation because it got a little difficult on me. Okay, so I wanna to talk to you a little bit about that. And hopefully you're all seeing that at the moment. Yes? Very good. Okay, perfect. So uh, the, I am the director of the Mount Lemmon Sky Center, which is the outreach and education program in the Department of Astronomy and Stewart Observatory based out of our Mount Lemmon observatories. And also uh, we have, you see a logo there for the University of Arizona Sky School. And those are really our formal K to 12 educational programs. And I, I put the logo separate because I'm gonna talk a little about both of them because they're both really exciting. And I'm trying to uh, give you different ways that you can think about what we do for outreach and possibly how to engage. And you see that this presentation is called Science Matters. And it's something that I did with another group, but I thought it would be, would be fun here because that's really the goal of our outreach and education programs is to convey an understanding that science matters. And so when you come up and visit, uh, hopefully Rosie can attest to this, we're not sitting there with a sledgehammer banging you over the head going, you know, science, 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 right? What we're doing is we're helping you uh, appreciate all of the wondrous things that you see around you. And then those beautiful things inspire questions and as we work together to figure out the answers to those questions, it, it just leaves you with a sense of, wow, science is a, a pretty rational way to understand the world around us. And it's not something that's inaccessible. And why are we not advancing? Okay, go. So uh, on that note, this is a, a quote that I heard on a podcast actually. So I had to listen multiple times to capture it, um, but it's a really good quote. This, this is a fellow who's Alan Duffy, professor of astronomy at Swinburne University. And he said, the idea of science is to take the wonder that can leave you passive or submissive or thinking, oh gosh, this is too big. It's too huge, too wondrous for me to comprehend or for me to do anything about. But with science, we can actually still retain that wonder, but be active and study more and be inspired by the world around us because we can ask those questions of it and demand the answers. And I'm sure, right, you guys are all members of Tucson Audubon. You go out, you look at birds, you look at other animals, you look at plants. That's exactly what you're doing, right? You're out there because of this sense of wonder that you have for the world around you. And it matters, right? It's, it is through science that we understand those things. And, you know, in astronomy in particular, but certainly in every other science, right, we seek a greater understanding of the universe. And in space science, it's about these big questions, right? How did life get to Earth? How do stars work? Are there other places that harbor life? And the idea is that we relate these increasing understanding to our own existence and our own future. And, and that's why we do what we do. And we enjoy playing with really cool toys, of course, but, but really it's about these bigger questions and that it's not inaccessible or difficult to understand. It just takes an interest in observing, looking around you, asking questions. 
And that can be done in the day, it can be done at night. Oops, backwards. So I'm a big fan of the quotes. And you'll see uh, this quote here, we are made of the same stuff as the stars. So when we study astronomy, we are in a way only investigating our remote ancestry and our place in the universe of star stuff. Our very bodies consist of the same chemical elements found in the most distant nebulae, and our activities are guided by the same universal rules. So that was a, a very famous astronomer, Harlow Shapley, in 1929. And on the right, you see a picture of what we call a globular star cluster. So this is a, a very tight-knit group of stars. There, there could be upwards of 200,000 stars in this cluster. And I won't talk to you uh, about it because that's not why we're here today, only to say to you, these are the kinds of things that when people participate in our programs, that we show them through the telescope. And it does take a dark sky to see this, this kind of thing. So when we have these programs, you know, we have really have four cornerstones. We have our public astronomical observing, our education, public and community outreach, things like we're doing today, and then grant collaborations. And so the, the astronomical observing, this is what, what Rosie did. Sorry, I keep mentioning you, Rosie, is we have this program called Sky Nights. And it's a, an amazing program. It's about five hours, starts a couple hours before sunset, goes through sunset. We feed you a light dinner so that you're nice and, and, and satisfied by the time it gets dark. And then you spend a couple hours at the telescope looking at, at objects around the sky. It's led by myself, uh, by many of our other fabulous presenters. We give you a lot of information on, on research projects that are up there, but really it's the idea is to inspire one towards thinking about the night sky and our place in the universe. This is something, you know, COVID, right? The mother of invention the last year is we started these virtual private star parties. So we connect a camera to the telescope and people can purchase a virtual program. So they interact with us much like you and I interacting now, and we show live streamed images through the telescope. Now, the live streamed images are certainly not this like the star cluster that you see. That's a very long exposure that takes several hours to acquire and then several hours of computer processing. But the images that we show you in the virtual program are grayscale. They're black and white as the camera sees them, much like you would if you were looking through the telescope. So it really is a, a neat representation virtually of what you would see at the telescope. And then we do things we call astronomer nights, where sometimes people want to come for a one-on-one -on -one personal experience all night long. So we treat you like a visiting astronomer. We have uh, things for special events, such as eclipses, meteor showers. And I don't have to tell you that's in a non-COVID world. And then we do a lot of remote astrophotography. So people all over the world will purchase time on the telescope and use it to acquire data to make those very pretty pictures. And so the, the Sky School, um, this, this is really what drives me personally. You know, it's fun getting up there and looking through the telescope night after night and sharing the excitement of that with people. Uh, but when you bring up a class of, of 40 students from you know, uh, grade school, middle school, high school, and they spend two to five days on the mountain, that's pretty neat. And so we actually work across all of the natural sciences that are available. We provide place-based and inquiry-based science education programs using this really unique Sky Island environment. And these programs are all uh, inquiry-based. So students come up and they make observations, they ask their own questions. And based on those questions, they come up with a testable hypothesis and then they carry out their own experiment under the guidance and mentorship of a University of Arizona student. It's a lot of fun. We also have what we call city programs where we go to the schools and we do a very similar thing in the schoolyard that tends to be with younger students. We do a lot of science teacher professional development in partnership with school districts and with Arizona Project WET. And we have what we call research apprenticeships. Uh, that, that's a developing program that we just received an award for where we will be matching university students with uh, students from local schools to earn credit at the University of Arizona while they carry out their own uh, field-based research project. And we do a lot of community outreach. We have star parties. So we take telescopes to schools and set them up for the community. We do live streams like this. We facilitate stargazing for Ventana Canyon, the Tucson Festival of Books, uh, lots of things. You see a nice picture there of some of the kids at one of our programs at sunset. Actually, it looks like the sun has just set and they're excited probably to go eat dinner. And then we collaborate on a lot of grants. And so when I say we collaborate, what we do is we facilitate some of the education and, and public outreach. And so one that's just going to be getting started July 1st is with the Catalina Sky Survey. They're the leading program for detecting near-Earth objects. So these are the asteroids that are potentially hazardous. 
things that at one point may cross the orbit of the Earth. And they would be mad at me if I didn't say right now, don't worry, there's nothing we know of that's, that's on an impact trajectory. Um, other than that Chinese rocket, which I'm sure you all saw uh, was somewhere, I think, over the uh, uh, Middle East or the Indian Ocean last week. Um, project Eden is a, a project that looks at, uh, I was going to say nearby, I'm not going to say nearby because they're not that close, but looks at bright stars that have planets passing in front of them, uh, what we call exoplanets, so planets outside of our solar system. So I want to kind of wrap up um, before I hand it off and, and show you this picture, because this is uh, a galaxy, I'm sure many of you know that, and it's the type of object we might show you during our program. Of course, the naked eye looking at this, it looks nothing like this. It would be grayscale and you wouldn't see this kind of detail. But when you look at it, right, you start to notice lots of things. You notice these beautiful colors, you see the, the spiral shape, you see that there are some pretty bright stars in the image. And when we have our programs and we look at an image like this, we really talk with people about, okay, what do you see? And as they start ticking off these things, the sh that spiral shape and the purple and blue in the arms and some of the different colored stars and these little fuzzy spots in the background, we can help them figure out what all of those things might mean just based on that observation. And that's the way that, that we engage people and inspire them to ask questions. So I hope, I hope that made sense. I'm, I'm really trying to speak kind of quickly uh, and move along uh, to, to introduce Anna Marie in a second. Uh, but I love to end with this. And so the little image uh, that you're seeing on the left, it's a two frame animation of the moment before and then the touchdown moment of NASA's OSIRIS-REx asteroid sampling mission to the asteroid Bennu. And this past October, it actually touched down and sampled the asteroid. And just yesterday, it actually uh, hit the drive, uh, put it in gear and started its journey home. And this was a University of Arizona-led mission to grab a piece of an asteroid and bring it back and look at some of those big questions, right, about perhaps how did life get to Earth? And also, this is a potentially hazardous asteroid. We have no reason to believe it'll ever hit us, but maybe we can learn some things about the asteroid as well. And everybody's favorite astronomer, if you're my age, right, Carl Sagan, in 1980, said, the surface of the Earth is the shore of the cosmic ocean. On this shore, we've learned most of what we know. And recently, we've waded a little way out, maybe ankle deep, and the water seems inviting. Some part of our being knows this is where we came from. We long to return, and we can, because the cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. So I hope that that gives you a little idea of the types of programs we run. Of course, I will tell you that, you know, you can contact me anytime because I, I really could talk all day about this stuff and I love to. Um, but I also hope that it encourages you to come up and visit. We are reopening our nighttime programs uh, this weekend coming up. Um, I will also tell you we're sold out uh, for this weekend and tickets are moving fast. Right now we're, we're limiting the programs uh, to 12 people because of COVID with a bunch of safety protocols. And, um, and we're doing them Friday, Saturday and Sunday nights. Uh, but check it out. Go to our website. I'll, I'll put the website into the chat when I'm done. Um, and of course, right, make it a day. Start at the bottom of the mountain and count how many different birds you see on the way up, because I'm sure that uh, pretty soon Olya is going to tell you that there is an incredible uh, diversity of species in, in the Catalina Mountains. So um, with that, I really want to turn it over to Anna Marie, who's my colleague uh, from the International Dark Sky Association. And they are great partners to us because there is nothing more important to what we do than than uh, preserving the dark skies and viewing them as a resource. Thank you so much. The, I want to go, I want to bird up all the way to the summit and do one of the programs. So that was really awesome. Um, Anna Marie, um, are you able to share your screen? Let me try it here. I'm a little, a little rusty. Um, Certainly. Uh, yeah, let's see, I'm gonna. So, so far we don't have any questions in the chat, but uh, we will have some time at the end if anything does come up, so. Right. How, can you see my? Looks great. All right, great. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm Anna Marie Schecker um, from the International Dark Sky Association. And I've been on staff at IDA for about three years. And Alan, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. And I'm really excited to 
to share with you what IDA does on behalf of the night sky and the night's time environment. So um, we recently had a, a event called International Dark Sky Week and we had these wonderful graphics designed for us and I think they just really encapsulate our work in terms of we're trying to, again, encourage others to, to join us to, to protect the night sky. And uh, this is a huge topic, as you can imagine. So I really do encourage you to check out our website at darksky.org. It has much more in-depth information about protecting the night sky. Um, and what I'm gonna do is just give you a really a broad overview, but I hope it does inspire you to, to learn more. So the International Dark Sky Association was um, founded in Tucson uh, in 1988 by two uh, people associated with the astronomy wor world. One was the uh, director of the uh, Kitt Peak Observatory, and another was um, the uh, an, an amateur astronomer. And they just happened, you know, they were got together because the uh, they noticed that the um, light, the night sky in Tucson was changing. So they said, oh, we need to form a group to pr to protect the night. So um, here we are. Uh, almost 30 years later, and we are a uh, leading organization working globally to protect the night. And um, we do indeed do that. Here is a map showing our, our influence around the world. Um, in the blue are the active areas of the world. So we've made a lot of progress, but there's still a lot to be done, <laughs> as you can imagine. So today I'm just gonna give you a little bit of an idea of like, of what is light pollution? and why should you care about it? And how can you help solve it? So um, we define light pollution as any artificial light that is not needed. And that is, that is a pollutant that has serious and harmful consequences. So it's kind of a bold statement. You think, might be thinking, why, how can light be a, a pollutant? Well, I want you to uh, think about this uh, in terms of this acronym called ALAN, um, Artificial Light at Night. Um, again, what we're talking about uh, in terms of light pollution is too much artificial outdoor light at night. So that's a, mouth, a mouthful, so we say light pollution, but that's the issue as well, this artificial light at night. And um, the thing about Alan, the artificial light at night is that it is unnatural. And you can see these different spectra of uh, sources of light, both natural at the top, the sunlight, there's the natural spectrum of sunlight. And then as you go down, um, you can see how it changes to the complex, compact fluorescent lighting that is often um, in our buildings. And you can see quite the difference there. Um, you can see a lot of that spectrum is in the blue area, and that's that's not great <laughs> for for people when you're inside. And then, as we'll talk about, uh, a lot of the lighting currently is is on the blue. The outdoor lighting currently is in the blue spectrum, and that's that's a big problem. So again, light pollution is the adverse effects of artificial light at night, and it comes in three main forms. There's sky glow. Sky glow is the brightening of the night sky over uh, inhabited areas. And, um, you know, sometimes when you see this in, out of an airplane, you think, wow, that's cool. But again, it just has these adverse effects. I believe this is over, this photo is over the, the LA basin. Another form of light pollution is glare. Glare is excessive brightness that causes visual discomfort. We're all familiar with this, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and also trespass, light trespass, uh, is, light where, uh, is light falling where it is not intended or needed. And this photo shows that very thing. Uh, here it is at night, but that facade of the building is, is lit up and you can see that people inside of the building are probably experiencing a lot of, um, a lot of light trespass. And also this, this photo is showing um, the, the glare bomb of that light in the front of the building and the sky glow at the top there. So all kinds of problems. And I believe this is in, in London. So I just talked about light pollution that's generated from excessive outdoor lighting, but 
Light pollution also comes in other forms. Uh, these new threats are uh, from the oil and gas industry with their flares. Um, the rising problem are, are the, the lighting from greenhouses. You can see that 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 glow from the at the in the this was taken in the early morning, but that's not natural, right? As you can imagine. And then of course these mega constellation satellites that are going, going up. Um, this is a huge concern for the astronomy, astronomy community and anyone interested in the night sky. So why care about this? You might think, well, you know, that's light is, we need the light, so what's the problem? But again, it may seem harmless, but light pollution has far reaching consequences that are harmful to all living things. For animals, um, artificial light at night dis disorients them disrupts their breeding cycles and makes them vulnerable to predators. Um, again, here's this baby sea turtle. This photo shows them going the correct way towards the light, the ocean, but often with bright lights on the beaches, they get um, misdirected and they wander off into the city and, and really impacts their, their population. And birds, of course, Oya will talk more about this, um, but they are also attracted to the light. Here you see these, this image of the birds um, getting trapped, kind of these light um, art installations. Insects are greatly impacted by light pollution. Um, they expend all their energy getting again trapped in these bright lights. They're easy prey uh, for their predators. And this is a huge uh, contributor to the insect apocalypse. Plants are also affected by artificial light at night. Um, those exposed to Allen, uh, they bud earlier, they lose their leaves later and have shorter lifespans. You can see in this photo um, how the distribution of light on these trees has affected their, their natural cycles. So the, the leaves directly under the light aren't changing. And of course, human health. Um, humans evolved on this planet with reliable cycles of light and dark. The addition of light into what has always been darkness disrupts our natural circadian rhythm. Our internal cycle syncing our biological clock with the night, the day night cycle. So um, even the AMA has come out and issued recommendations about lighting. And of course, um, light pollution impacts our heritage of, of dark skies. Again, referring to what Alan was talking about um, in terms of the sense of wonder that looking at the natural night sky can, can in, 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 uh, how people can be engaged that way. Our ancestors experienced this night sky that um, inspired science, religion, philosophy, art, literature, but now, and millions of children across the globe potentially will never know the wonders of the Milky Way. And of course, um, artificial light at night is a driver of climate change. It, light pollution also wastes a lot of money and energy. About 35% of lighting worldwide is wasted, shooting straight up into the sky. So when we do the math, we spend about three to seven billion dollars a year on wasted light while adding 21 million tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere each year. So currently, um, this is becoming, of course, and has been, but it's growing even more that it's a global issue. Um, Currently 80% of people live under a polluted sky and it's growing at two, more than 2% annual, uh, annual rate. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a growing problem. Um, so the, a big issue is the fact that most people, like we said, are living under light polluted skies. And it's this classic problem in conservation that you can't save what you don't love and you don't love what you don't know. So um, this is what IDA is trying to address in terms of 
you know, look, thinking about people living in these polluted inner city skies and connecting them with these dark skies. So that's, we feel is a big part of our job is that we are, need to increase awareness about the importance of the night sky as a natural resource and it deserves protection. So just quickly, I'll just touch on some, some quick solutions, just not to leave you, you know, with a lot of bad news. There is a lot of positivity. There's, we're, really, we're really excited about the future and how we're gonna address the issue. And a lot of that is, is with your help. So again, we, we together will address this issue. And this, the big solution is the fact that is uh, the emphasis on the community friendly lighting that IDA has. And it's a lot of, again, awareness about dark sky friendly lighting, that there is this lighting that's out there that is probably very bad. And then, you know, we are trying to educate our advocates and our, and our constituency to think about that there are, there's best lighting practices. So um, an, an easy way to think about this is the stars, a stars up and lights down. We don't, we're not saying, IDA doesn't say that we don't need any lights. We do need lights, but they need to be good, good lights. And those are shielded lights, lights on the ground. So that doesn't spill out and that we're able then to see the night sky. And a great example of where this is working is in fact, our own city, Tucson, Arizona. Here's Tucson at night. And uh, we were working with partners um, to implement best lighting practices. And we have guidelines for that. The lighting should be useful. It should have a clear purpose. It should be targeted. It should only be directed to where it's needed. That it should be the proper intensity, no more brighter than it needs to be. It should be controlled on a timer. And it should be the proper color in terms of warm color, not the, like the, not the bright white light to be a warm golden color. So how can we realistically solve this problem? Again, it's through our advocates, people understanding the issue, people knowing those best practices and reaching out to their uh, community leaders to implement these sorts of um, guidelines. And there is great um, movement towards this. Again, in our own city, uh, Tucson, uh, we, the city recently upgraded the streetlights here and it reduced pollution by 7%. This change realized a $2.3 million in annual energy savings by converting energy efficient LED streetlights, pointing them down and other measures. And there's much more about this on our website. And I really do encourage you to, to read about it because this is a great case study that this can be done. Um, again, just some more facts about that from this, this reduction that IDA helped with the city work to implement these changes. And again, uh, we have a wonderful program called the International Dark Sky Places Program um, that conserves the, the natural night sky in, in many places around the world. Currently there are 176 of these dark sky places around the world um, in 20 countries, um, averaging, well, encompassing more than over more than 100,000 uh, um, kilometers, square, square kilometers. <laughs> so it is, there is good news. This is a glowing, a growing global movement. Um, here's just some of our areas that are really taking off in terms of really embracing this movement. So I'll just stop there. Um, Thank you so much, Anna Marie. Yeah. A question here in the chat. Um, does your strategy differ in international countries? Um, yes and no, I'll say, uh, you know, we do work with the local leaders there in the area. We do have guidance for them, but it's, it, it's very collaborative for sure. We're not here to impose things, but to say, well, these are the best practices that we found. And, you know, we'll work with the, with the people that, you know, to make it work for the area. Yeah, education is key, I agree. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen.
So we can tell that dark skies are beneficial to all, but how are they beneficial to birds? So first of all, birds are already bombarded with different threats, um, habitat loss and degradation due to urbanization, agriculture and climate change, invasive species such as outdoor domestic cats, collisions with glass, uh, whether because of their reflectivity, transparency or illumination, collisions Collisions with other man-made structures, such as wind turbines and communication towers. And finally, pesticide use that wipes out the insects they feed on and poisons the songbirds directly. All these aspects and more contribute to the fact that 2.9 billion birds are gone since 1970. You may have heard this um, startling statistic. It just recently came out in the news and it's, it's scary to hear and difficult to comprehend. Of those 2.9, 2.5 billion birds are migratory. So that means they're, they make a journey twice a year to and from their breeding grounds. Migration is actually one of the most dangerous times in the bird's life. They make, they have to make a long trek to their wintering or breeding grounds, uh, chasing those resources. It is a very energy consuming journey and birds already have to navigate things like natural weather events. But now um, there are even more obstacles for them such as uh, different man-made structures um, and other man-made factors. So they're also affected differently based on their migration tactics. So for example, birds travel at different altitudes and at different times of day. For example, ra uh, raptors uh, travel during the day, uh, hence the Tubac hawk watch that we have annually in March. And most songbirds and waterfowl travel at night. Artificial light has a confusing effect on birds that migrate at night. It attracts birds that are navigating the night sky by washing out the horizon and the, the stars in front of them. And during cloudy conditions, they end up becoming grounded uh, or hitting tall buildings when looking for a clearing in the sky, but, but they end up being fooled by the sky glow instead. So most collisions end up in injury or death. And even those, even those birds that seem just stunned um, on the ground from a hit, they are still very susceptible to the ground predators, car traffic, um, as well as succumbing to internal injuries. Artificial light causes some birds to also veer off course, spending already precious energy flying towards the lit up cities. Bright lights are very disorienting. Uh, consider this example that Anna Maria has also brought up. This is the 9-11 memorial that has two beams of very strong light projected into the night sky to resemble the towers. The pillars of light are visible from a hundred mile radius. This is very, very powerful, strong, bright light. At times, over a thousand birds are caught, were caught in the beams themselves. Every single dot you see here is a bird. And after lobbying from the New York City Audubon, they now turn off the lights for 20 minute intervals to allow the birds to move on. And the birds actually began normal behavior almost immediately after the lights went off. In addition to light, windows on buildings are dangerous to birds because of their transparent properties as well as the reflective properties um, of habitat or sky above. Up to 1 billion birds die from window strikes in the US every single year. And as we spend a lot of time and money to invite birds to our yards by providing food, water, and shelter. 
We should also try to reduce the hazards that come with um, birds being near buildings and provide safe passage. And that is what our goal is with our new Bird Safe Buildings program with Tucson Audubon. This year we secured two grants to tackle this pro pro problem right here in Southeast Arizona. So we're addressing both issues of residential home window strikes as well as commercial high rise window strikes. Our goal is to study and document the problem in our area so that we can um, understand which species are affected the most, which areas and buildings need our attention because no such program has existed here before. So we're gathering more information. We also plan to reach out to, we're already reaching out, I should say, to the general public and our Tucson Audubon membership to educate and provide resources on what they can do to make their windows bird safe. The overarching goal, of course, is to prevent window collisions in Arizona, which is a major uh, migratory flyway. So relating directly to artificial light, um, artificial light pollution and bird safe buildings, we created two routes in urban Tucson along problematic buildings. Um, high, right, high rise buildings like this are notorious for window strikes, especially in bigger city centers uh, due to lighting and reflections. But during peak migration period of April through May in our area, we have volunteers walk these routes to document any window strikes that may have occurred during um, the night before. In this picture, you can see a forecast of bird migration for our area on May 4th, 2021, which is just a few days ago. Using radars, Cornell's BirdCast website predicted that 11.5 million birds were to fly over Arizona that night. That morning, one of our volunteers collected a black-headed grosbeak and a cliff swallow in the urban center as we and as we continue to monitor and document these strikes, we will use this information to approach building managers and ask them to turn off the lights, at least during peak migration for Arizona. And by having volunteers out there collecting this information and looking for um, any injured birds, they can also rescue any uh, birds in need and take them to our partner Tucson Wildlife Center. If you would like to help us fight for dark skies and safe passage to birds, you can follow these steps. Uh, turn off any unnecessary exterior lights. Anna Marie has already covered this really well. Um, if it's not necessary, it's not, it shouldn't be there. Um, turn off your interior lights when not in use or just shut the blinds so that there's less spillover. Um, install exterior lights with motion sensors and downward shielding to reduce that spillover again. And when converting um, a new lighting, do assess that quality and quantity of light needed. Avoid overlighting with that bright new technology. More resources are available on uh, International Dark Sky website, darksky.org. It is also imperative to make your windows visible to birds by following the methods listed on our website, tucsonaudubon.org slash window strikes. You can also register for a free bird safe buildings program on the same page. And this summer we have a promotion going that each month we will raffle off a window collision prevention kit sponsored by Feather Friendly. So head over and register and you will be able to qualify for that. So that wraps it up for us today and we still have some time to answer any questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my uh, screen. Thank you, Olia. Thank you, Anna Marie and Alan. Uh, it looked like Anna Marie um, answered one of the previous questions about dark sky places in Arizona on the chat. But Anna Marie, do you have a favorite dark sky place in Arizona that is your favorite 
that you really appreciate? Uh, there's so many. I just, you know, but what really struck me was we got to we got the chance to go to Kitt Peak and do their program, and that was fantastic in terms of. I'm sure it's the same at Mount Lemon, <laughs> but uh, just that that night sky was just wow, mind blowing. I mean, I. I hadn't really experienced that before. So I know that's not on the list in terms of Kid Peak, but it's that's a, that's definitely that's it. Uh, yeah, it's always always good to hear what what our presenters' favorite places are like that. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Karen had a question about whether uh, the international uh, dark skies has any influence on solar light manufacturing. Um, I, I guess that's not really come up as far as I know. Um, we'd work a lot with the outdoor, you know, the streetlight manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just, I'm wondering, I'd like to hear more about her question to see what to, for her to clarify, but, um. Yeah, Karen, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you could, um, share that those thoughts with Anna Marie, if you'd like. Hi, I was wondering if um, solar light, like yard solar light manufacturers could create timer switches. So that way they could be turned off like in two to three hours. So you could take advantage of solar lighting, but also help uh, with dark sky support. That's, that's a great, uh, proposition. I'll definitely bring it up with our lighting person to see what they say uh, about it. So thank you for raising that. Well, thanks, Karen. Uh, Lynn was wondering, does the relative humidity or aridity of location affect the degree of light pollution? Yeah, I would say, um, again, I'm not the expert on the topic, but uh, that's it does contribute to the sky glow um, in terms of the, you know, the light bouncing off the particles and the, of the, the humid air. Um, certainly places yeah. with fog, yeah, has a lot of yeah, light. Yeah, so I can, I can add to that a little. So the, the amount of light pollution, of course, is strictly a function of, of what we're doing, right? <laughs> what we're putting out into the atmosphere. Um, and so that's why it's important that we make the changes. Um, but you're absolutely correct that the atmosphere uh, diffuses the light depending on what's in there. So, you know, it's something I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with from photography, but the more dust, the more humidity, right? All of those things do kind of diffuse the light in the atmosphere, but as a, a matter of amount, it is really uh, on the humans. Yeah, that's a good point. Looks like we have a couple of questions about um, color of light. So Carl asks, um, are outdoor bug light bulbs an acceptable color for exterior exterior residential lights? And then also Nancy asked, do you ever light outdoors with red lights? So uh, any thoughts on color of lights? Yeah, the red light, that's, that's becoming more of a trend in our um, dark sky places, those areas that, um, that, that encourage visitors that they, there needs to be some kind of light especially with, you know, sensitive, this sensitive astronomy equipment. Um, we're definitely seeing that more. Um, in terms of, you know, for your own outdoor lighting, um, again, there's a lot of, I mean, the red lighting, that might be a little extreme for your house, you know, but, uh, uh, but there's definitely a, a long list on our website about, uh, you know, dark sky friendly lighting and places where you can get it. Um, and the bug lighting, that's, I think that's fine. Like the, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. A uh, couple of last questions here. Irene was wondering about spotlights that, uh, what about spotlights that focus on a narrow specific range? Um, again, I, I would just ask you to think about why you're using that. Um, and, you know, if, I understand about the safety issue and you need to see things and that's, that's all, that's, that's all legitimate and fine, but, you know, try to think about using a timer for that or like have a, a motion sensor is a great tool. 
Um, often that's even a better thing to have a motion sensor because then that really alerts you to the fact that somebody's out there, something's out there. If it's on all night, you're not going to know who's coming and going. So if you need to use it, absolutely need to use it, uh, yeah, put it on a, with a motion sensor. And also, you know, keep in mind, right, when we talk about light, where do we need that light? We don't need it in the sky, right? The sky doesn't help your safety. It doesn't keep you from slipping on ice or, um, or anything like that, right? We want the light on the ground. And so the most important thing is to use some kind of fixture that's shielded and by, you know, have that covered so that the light isn't escaping up into the night sky. Um, you know, and, and red is helpful. It, it's really probably more helpful for human vision because it, it preserves any dark adaptation that we may have, you know, but certainly many animals are going to see that red light as very bright and certain instruments on telescopes are going to see that red light as, as very bright. So um, it, the most important thing is to really think about how much light do we need and to keep that light ground directed to the ground. Yeah, and, and those are really good responses. I think it goes along with Polly's question about how do you address the view of more light means higher protection from theft and having those timers on there and motion sensors. Um, and like I said, where do we need the light at? That's a good response there. Um, this might go along with that same thing that Martha was wondering. Uh, she says there may be some studies showing that certain light colors help reduce crime. If you know about this, are they the same colors that help reduce Allen? And we're not talking about Dr. Allen, we're talking about other Allen. This is something that IDA, uh, you know, really kind of struggles with in terms of the studies, because that would be very helpful that we could, you know, point to, to, to specific studies, but they, they, um, they're not really funded, unfortunately, that kind of research. So there are, we do have an Allen, the artificial light at night database uh, on our website that has all sorts of, uh, you know, academic research studies. So it'd be a good place to go and, and to see if that's been referenced there. Yeah, that, there are certainly colors that are more friendly um, in different ways, right? Colors that don't interfere with what humans see as much, colors that interfere less with astronomical instruments, right? So for instance, if, if a telescope is using an infrared detector and there's infrared emissions, right? Um, that can be problematic, but, I, but again, overall, it's, um, you know, we can certainly think about those colors that are helpful, but at the end of the day, you know, we've got to reduce the amount of light that's up there. Um, and point those things at the ground. The, the Earth's atmosphere itself makes light. Uh, that's one of the reasons that, you know, there's some benefit to space telescopes, for example, right? So when you think about birds and wildlife, it really is important, regardless of, of color spectrum, that we try to have the night environment as natural as possible. And so I think, again, rather than focus too much on the color, let's focus on, on decreasing the amount and getting it ground directed. At least that's the opinion I always share. So, Yeah, that, that's great advice. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. We really appreciate that. And I think that covers all of our questions. So thank you to all, all of our presenters and our partners in this, this program. And uh, any last thoughts from Anna Marie, Alan, Olea, any, any last thoughts to send us off? Luke, it's Rosie. Oh, hey, Rosie. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to add that the uh, program at the Sky Center is, is a wonderful program and it's very informative. So if you have an opportunity to go up there for five hours, it's well worth it. And dress warmly. <laughs> uh, thank, thanks, Rosie. We'll, uh, we'll settle up after the, uh, after the video <laughs> conference. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. That's great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rosie. Well, uh, everyone, we want to uh, just say thank you to our presenters. So uh, we always like to end these with uh, encouraging people to take themselves off and mute and thank, thank people verbally. So go ahead and give your shout out to Dr. Alan Strauss and Anna Marie Shecker and Olia Phillips and for all that they're doing uh, to move us towards reducing the light pollution. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.